Amen. Who is ready for Christmas? Has everybody got their shopping done? No? All right, you're like me. So we'll go to Dollar General afterwards and meet up. Amen. Amen. It's good to see everybody in the house of God this morning. It's, it's a good day to serve God. It's a good day just to be in the house of God. Amen. The cool weather is moving in. And then Christmas Day, it's going, we're going to be able to wear shorts and t-shirts. Amen. We're just, we're ready. We're ready for all things. But welcome again to Oak Park Church of God. We're so, well, we're so glad that everybody is here. We are ready for an awesome season that God is going to take Oak Park through. And we believe for greater things. Amen. Is everybody ready to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. I, I want to read something as I was reading something this week. And God was really challenging me to really think about who He is this Christmas season. And I've heard sermons about we need to give and Christmas season is, a, is about giving. But right now, in this moment, this is who Jesus was. It says in Philippians 2, verse 8 and on, and it says, And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death, even to death on the cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and given him the name that at every name the under heaven and in on earth every knee should bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. This season, guys, this Christmas, he is Lord of all. He is King of all. And he is here to save and to redeem you and to give you health like you've never had it before. Amen. I'm so ready for this service. God is going to do great and mighty things. Get out of your seat. Welcome somebody new. And let's have church.
Oh 
musicians play how many of you are glad Messiah has come how many of you are glad that we are blessed to live in the age of God's amazing grace can you shout amen I want you to look at your neighbor before you're seated and I want you to tell them Merry Christmas You may be seated. On this Christmas Sunday, I could not imagine having church the Sunday before Christmas without going to Holy Communion. The candles are lit, signifying that Jesus is the light of the world. The table before us is a sacred table. The sacrament, we take the bread. 
which tells us that the body of Christ literally was broken, striped, beaten. We take the fruit of the vine, the cup, which tells us that the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. I want the ushers to serve you at this time. And I want you, as you are being served, to remain reverent, reflective, contemplative of what Christ coming to earth means to us. We cannot allow this season to go by and not reflect upon the gift of eternal life. Ushers, would you at this time take the elements? Would you serve them to the congregation? The Lord's Supper teaches us to be thankful for the gift. The gift of eternal life. The gift that we find in John 3, 16 that says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. He gave His life that we might have life. For John teaches that he that has the Son of God has life. And he that does not have the Son of God does not have life. You see, when Christ came, he offered a new way. He offers a new beginning. How many of you are thankful today that in Christ you have a new beginning? Lord, at this supper today, I commit to bring this life to as many people as possible. The life that you have granted me can only be celebrated by sharing it with someone else. So today, church, I share with you and help us tomorrow to share it with those that are around us. It has been well said that history is his story. The Lord's Supper is deeply rooted in history. Passover. Passover commemorated deliverance. And today, we celebrate a deliverance from the life of sin. Paul would take the church at Corinth to communion and he writes for I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is broken for you Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
With all having been served, I would like for you to remove the cellophane and take the bread, please. The bread that you are holding in your hand represents our Lord's body. Let's pray. Father, I thank you now for the broken body of your Son, Jesus. For through that broken body, there is healing, there is deliverance. And Lord, I do this in remembrance of you. And I do this. And when I do this, I'm testifying that I believe you are soon to return in the clouds of glory. In Jesus' name, would all partake? Would you remove the wrapper from the cup? This cup represents the shed blood of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness apart from the blood. I want us to pray giving thanks for the blood of Jesus. Father, I thank you today for the blood of your son Jesus. Shed on the cross as the atoning sacrifice for my sin. And Lord, today we receive this cup thanking you for redemption through the blood. In Jesus' name, would all partake. I want you to reverently stand. There is no greater time to pray for the sick than at communion. It has been well said that communion is the meal that heals. A former state overseer of the Church of God in Alabama, M.H. Kennedy, shared with a friend of mine that in the latter years of his life, he took communion every day and trusted God with his healing. Pastor Welch is going to come and he's going to share prayer needs and pray with you and over you. And I want us today to touch the throne of God in this Christmas service. If you need healing today, you can be healed. That was weak. If you need healing, you can be healed. Do you believe He heals? There is power and efficacy in the sacrifice of Jesus. What a blessed privilege we have today to pray and to believe in the power that heals. I want to make two requests and then I will allow you to lift a hand. One of my dearest friends, the first missionary that I walked on African soil with that took me to village after village after village that created such a love in my heart to leave a good church, to leave a family, leave America and go back to Africa and spend so many of my years and my wife and I to spend so many of our years on African soil. I want you to pray this morning for Brother John Treherne. He's in California, but Jesus is in California too. And Jesus can touch our Brother Treherne with healing power today. And then I want you to pray for Brother Joy Turner uh, from our own congregation, from our own church. Brother Joy needs a special, special healing touch from the Lord today and we just took of communion believing that he is the savior that died for us he took the stripes for our healing and he's at the right hand of the father today in a scening for us so he's going to name brother Joy's name to the father and he's going to name brother John Treherne's name to the father 
And I want us to just lift our hands together as we pray and believe for the healing in your body in all of our lives today. Father, we thank you. What a holy presence we feel in this house. What a blessed time to take of the blood and the cup. What a blessed time to lift our hands and our hearts in faith believing that you are the Christ that came to save, to heal, and to deliver. You're the Christ that came to take our sins and bury them in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered against us again. You're the Christ that took the stripes and we could bring our needs and our infirmities and our sicknesses and know that you're the Christ that across this congregation and out in California and over in Africa today, you're touching lives and you're healing them and bringing them into the wonderful presence of Jesus the Christ. We bless you. We praise you. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let the people of God give him praise today. Come on. Come on. Let's give him our best praise today. Hallelujah. He alone is worthy. You may be seated. Several years ago, I was privileged to be a member of the Alabama State Youth Board for the Church of God. And every summer, we worked youth camps. And every summer, they would send us so many students from Lee University working youth camps. And there was a young man that caught my eye that summer as a diligent worker, dedicated to God. And I knew this young man was going to do something with his life. He married a young lady from Lee. They both finished school at Lee University. And God has put it on his heart. He and she live in the Calera, Calera area south of Birmingham. And God has placed it on Josh Howell's heart, Josh and Jamie, to plant a church there. I shared with you this week, I am convinced in the 21st century, one of the greatest harvests, harvests that we will reach as a church is the planting of churches. Doug Baker, out of this church, was a church planter. Aren't you glad that in 1956, a church of God was planted in Tillman's Corner, Alabama? Aren't you glad? Josh has roots here in Mobile. Josh's grandmother was part of the McDuffie family. Josh's aunt, Faye Howell, is a member of this church. Josh's grandfather and grandmother pastored for years in Tuscaloosa. And Josh, I want you and Jamie to come. I want them to meet you and welcome you. And I want you to share and give a highlight of what God has done and is going to do through this young couple. They have jobs. Uh, he works for State Farm. You are a teacher. And uh, they will give their life's work to the Calera area. I want you to give them a warm Oak Park welcome today. I, uh, it's a, uh, an honor and a privilege to be able to, to stand here among you on the during the Christmas season and uh, like Brother Box said I represent my family I represent my uh, my heritage growing up and uh, I I honor and cherish that that heritage and we did go uh, I met this this uh, pretty looking lady here at, uh, at Lee University and uh, had no idea had a completely different idea of of what I thought my wife would look like. I thought she'd have brown hair, brown eyes, shorter than me. She's got strawberry blonde hair, and uh, she's about as tall as I am. And uh, God kind of changes sometimes what you think, what you got planned. And uh, about a year ago, I think it is, um, 
I met Brother Box. He was traveling through town, and I said, hey, would you like to eat? He said, sure, let's go to Full Moon. I said, sounds good. So we went there and ate, and he was meeting and eating and talking with me, and in the middle of the conversation, he just kind of stopped, and he had no idea what was on our heart. God had began to change our heart and began to change our, our passion, and uh, we, had, we had been at a local church and been serving there for several years, and, and God began to call us to Kalir. We were driving 45 minutes back and forth between the churches we were serving at. They couldn't uh, afford us as, as staff or full-time staff, and so we were working there, and and uh, God began to call us and, and just give us a, a deep passion for the lost in Kalira. And he looked at me and he said, look, I know you're not planning on staying at that church. And he said, I was about to pump some gas. And he, and he said, it came to my mind, won't Josh look at planning a church in Kalira? And what he didn't know was we were already signed up for some classes. We are already planning on going to some classes. We had already started talking about it. And so, uh, so we kind of went on that path, and God began to, to, to open up our eyes just to the people in our neighborhood, just to the families in our area. And we began to look at it, and we didn't realize just in our area, we've lived there for about 11 years. And there's, we began to look at the stats, and there's 53% of just the city of Calera that, that doesn't go to church on a regular basis at all. In the, one of the fastest uh, growing counties in, in Alabama, Shelby County, only 14 to 15 percent of them actually consider themselves religious. That means any religion, Muslim, Buddhist, Christian, anything, they only consider themselves religious. Only 14, 15 percent of the whole county actually considers themselves religious at all. And so, but God began to, to, to lead and, and guide that and begin to sit here and think about it. And I was telling Brother Boxman was driving into the parking lot this morning, our heritage. Our heritage. We, we've, I've got a great family. I've got family that's been pastors in their lives. And we were sitting here taking communion this morning. And I kept the cup, by the way. <laughs> I was taking communion. I thought, there's over half of my city has never partaken in, participated in communion. Over half my city doesn't understand the bread. Over half my city doesn't understand the blood. And God is calling us to reach them. God's calling us to let them know, hey, you can come in. doesn't matter. You guys do a great job. I, I was telling Brother Box, you guys do everything in such excellence here. It's, it's, it's astounding. I, and, I, and I applaud the, the, the leadership, the staff, and everyone here. You guys do a great job of mer merging the heritage that we grew up with and trying to reach those that have no heritage, that doesn't have a deep-rooted, seated faith in Christ and their family. And so that's what we're trying to reach. We want to reach those. We want to make church a, a place where people can come in and enjoy the presence of God. We want to make church a, a place that they can come into it, not some place that they have to go. And you'll see it. We've got a video here. But a place that they get to go on Sunday morning. Not something that's begrudging. And so we we appreciate uh, Brother Box's opportunity to come here and help us um, uh, be able to support our church and, and our church plant. And uh, we appreciate anything you guys can do doing that. Um, we have, it, it takes a lot of funds to start a church. More than more than I would have ever imagined. It takes a lot of a lot of funds, a lot of support, and so we appreciate anything that Oak Park can do. We appreciate Brother Box's support, and we appreciate your prayers and love. Thank you. Hi, hi. My name is Josh Howell, and this is my wife Jamie. Thank you for your interest in Lake Hills Church. Here's a quick rundown of our game plan. We're launching a brand new church right here in NXS in Calera, Alabama. We've had a heart for Calera in Shelby County for many years, and we want Lake Hills Church to be a place that people can come, leave the cares of the week behind, and enjoy God's presence. We want Lake Hills to change your idea of church from a place you have to go to a place that we get to go. Yeah, and there are several ways you can be a part of Lake Hills Church. You can follow us on Facebook or by checking out our website at lakehillscalera.org. There will be news and updates on all the upcoming events and ways that you can help. 
Most importantly, we need you to be praying for us. We need God's wisdom and we need God's favor on everything we do. There's also ways you can help financially. Maybe you even want to be a part of the launch team. So follow us and we'll keep you updated with news as you consider how you can help us launch Lake Hills Church. I want you to join me today. I sent you out a letter and a special envelope for this. If you didn't get to bring your envelope with you, in your offering, mark church plant in addition to your normal tithing and giving. Can I tell you, I had a couple to testify to me today of some things God is doing in their life financially. And can I tell you the key, don't miss this, the key to any financial blessing is to be a tither and a giver. When you don't even have, but yet you give. How many of you have had God to give you a financial miracle? Somebody shout amen. amen. I want you today, join me. Join me in helping. Join me in carrying the gospel. Father, right now, I ask you, Lord, to anoint our giving. God, I pray that it would be unto you. And Lord, I pray that every need of Lake Hills and every need of Oak Park today are going to be met in Jesus' name. I want us to welcome one of our newest musicians, Savannah Lee. Can we welcome her today? Come on, let Savannah know. Before the choir comes, let me make mention, tonight we will be having service at 5 o'clock and then we will not have service Wednesday night and next Sunday morning we will have 10.30 worship service. No Sunday school, but a 10.30 worship service. Offices will be closed Tuesday through Friday. I'm asking you to enjoy the holidays with your family. Let me also make mention, I wanna, we're, we're in a transition of sorts here at Oak Park with our hospitality ministry and some things we're launching. And I want our zone ushers to stand, please. I want all of our zone ushers to stand, men and women that are doing the zone usher ministry. Let me tell you what they're going to be doing. They are going to be taking up offering, passing out bulletins, greeting visitors, and they will be taking care of our guests so that we can be getting them registered, and they will also be caring for their particular section. We need a few more. If you will see uh, Teresa or Brother Charlie Ingram or our sister uh, Box, we will put you to work. But I'm going to tell you, I'm proud of what you're doing. 
Uh, transition is always new and has challenges, but we are believing God that this is going to help us to more effectively reach the harvest. I want you to let your zone ushers know you appreciate them. We appreciate you guys. God bless you. Worship with the choir, and I'm coming back with the word in a moment. Take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Luke, chapter 1. While you're turning, let me make mention that immediately after church, Pastor Stewart and I would like to meet with all the students that are interested in possibly attending Lee University and their parents immediately after service, if I could meet with those students and parents. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. 
I've talked about the hope that Christmas brings at Advent. Another theme of Advent is peace. And I want to enter what I want to interwove that in today's message. Starting at verse 26, notice. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man who was, whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. Don't miss this verse. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Oh, that's good preaching right there. Then Mary said, Behold the maid servant of the Lord, let it be a court to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I want to speak to you this morning and tonight on the thought, Don't be afraid at Christmas. Lift your hand right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you. And God, I thank you for the power of your Spirit. I thank you, God, for the power that came upon Mary and she conceived. Lord, I pray for the anointing of your Spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. Ever since the fall of man, fear has been a part of the human existence. What are we afraid of? Pain? Rejection? Or are we afraid of failure? Or afraid of making a mistake? Some are afraid of getting hurt. Some are bound by fear that they have phobias. Phobias that plague them. Most students of history will remember that Franklin D. Roosevelt, the President of the United States, in the throes of the Depression said, and I quote, We have nothing to fear but fear itself. However, some 40 million Americans deal and battle with anxiety. Chapman University conducted a survey on fear. They conducted a survey on the things that we fear. And they found that there are ten domains of fear. I want to talk about five of them. In America, we fear crime. Murder, rape, theft, burglary, fraud. Some fear daily life. Romantic rejection, ridicule, talking to strangers, man-made disasters such as terrorism, 
natural disasters, and personal anxiety. So fear is out there. Even in the Bible we find men who were stalked by their fears. Abraham. Though Abraham was called the father of the faithful, out of fear he lied and said that Sarah was not his wife. And then there was Jacob. Jacob, in in an estrangement from his brother, feared his own brother Esau, Moses. Moses, so revered by the Israelites that when he died, God hid him and buried him where they would not make an idol out of his burial. But he feared rejection and feared failure and feared Pharaoh. And what about the army of Israel? The army of Israel that knew their God would win battles, but yet for 40 days Goliath calls them to shake in their boots in fear. Not a lot has changed in mankind. In 2015, 18% of America's population struggles with anxiety, worry, or fear in some way. Some people fear at Christmas. They fear not having enough money to be able to provide Christmas presents for their families. And some fear the white envelopes that are going to come after Christmas from American Express and Visa. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We fear. We fear not meeting man's expectations. And in light of what's recently happened in San Bernardino, California, and even yesterday in Madison, Wisconsin, we fear terrorism. 44% of Americans say they fear a terrorist attack. In light of the division in American politics, we fear the future. But I have come by to tell you that there are three words in the Christmas story on three occasions where people were told not to fear. Somebody shout amen. Amen. There was a preacher in the state of Kentucky that shared the story when he was a little boy. When he was a little boy, he lived near a country store. And he would walk to that country store many, many times. His name was Luther. He said, in the winter, one winter afternoon, I went to that country store. He said, I tarried and stayed a little too long at that store and it got dark. He said, traveling back to my house through those dark woods, I became afraid. And all of a sudden, I heard a voice asking me, Luther, are you afraid? To which he replied, Daddy, I was until I heard your voice. May I tell you, in 2015, we need to hear the Father's voice again. Oh, I'm preaching right now. You see, three times God says... In this story, don't be afraid. I'm going to cover at least one today. First of all, do not fear the providence of God. I want to talk about that word providence. Sounds a little fancy, a little theological. And sometimes we as Pentecostals and Charismatics... We love victory. Shout a good amen if you love victory. We love sunshiny days. How many of you know that? But we don't often deal well with the rain. It's rainy days. It's rainy Mondays. If you don't believe that, I saw the forecast for next week and my heart sank. It's supposed to rain this week. We need some theology to help us out on the rainy days. And one of those is called the providence of God. 
You see, there's one school of thought that says God was like the master clock maker. That he made the world and he made man like a master clock and he wound it up set it on the shelf, left it by itself to run all its own. But that's not our God. Scripture teaches us otherwise. The providence of God says that our lives are not ruled. If you've ever heard anything I've said in 13 years to you, don't miss this. The providence of God says that our lives are not determined by luck, or fate, or chance, or by the spin of a wheel. The providence of God says this, that God in, God is involved in creation and that God cares for what he... Ooh, I'm about to shout. God cares for what He created. God is involved in what He created. And God has a master plan for what He created. If you don't believe that, it's Jeremiah 29, 11 that says, For I know the plans that I have. Have for you, says the Lord. They are plans to give you a future and a hope, not to destruct you. I want to tell you today that God is in control. Oh, I'm feeling some preaching coming on. I want to tell you today that the Democrats are not in control. The Republicans are not in control. The Tea Party is not in control. Wall Street is not in control. The oil investors are not in control but Jehovah the sovereign God is in control today hallelujah one of my mentors he's now in heaven now in glory brother R.L. Tyler said this and I will never forget it He said, when the historians have crossed the last T and dotted the last I in the history of the civilization of man and man's history on earth is finished, God will still be in control. Can I tell you the other day in San Bernardino, California, God was still in control. Can I tell you this week when the budget was passed in Washington, God was still in control control. When man walked on the moon, God was in control. Hallelujah. When man launched the first missile, God was in control. When the atomic bomb fell, God was in control. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. On the worst day of your life, God will still be in control. On the best day of your life, God is in control. Hallelujah. I wish somebody would give him praise. Praise in the house today. Mm, I feel him today. Life's going great for Mary. Now Mary's not rich. I'm going to preach a message on prosperity one of these days. And I'm going to blow several folks out of the saddle when I do. I read this last night. Do you realize the Bible said that God prospered Joseph and Joseph was in prison? And I read this comment, the commentator said, Prosperity has absolutely nothing to do with what you possess, but has everything to do with who possesses you. Pretty good, isn't it? Pretty good. Everything's going well for Mary. She's poor. But she's godly. She's chaste. Everything is going well. We don't know a lot about her. She's probably 15 years old. She's of the tribe of Judah. She has maintained her sexual purity, her spiritual spiritual purity. She is betrothed to a carpenter named Joseph. Now that's a little more binding than our engagement. Yes, engagement, we give a ring, but betrothal was very binding. But then everything 
changed. How many of you know that your life can change in a day's time? In a moment of time, on a dime, as my grandmother used to say, your life can change. You see, Mary's life is going great, but all of a sudden her life is challenged. The angel Gabriel comes to Mary and he makes an announcement to her. You are going to have a baby. Do you realize that very announcement is going to make her suspect. That very announcement's going to ruin her reputation. Think about Christmas from a way you've never thought about it. Do you realize that very announcement could cause her to be stoned to death? That very announcement will challenge her life. And she is called upon in a moment's time to bear shame and humiliation for the glory of God. Mary would have the greatest honor in history. Now think about it. We honor Mary. Mary is honored She would have the greatest honor of bearing the child. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. The social stigma of this is going to be more than she can take. And can I tell you that sometimes there are going to be things in your life that come your way that God allows and you don't always understand it. And I'm going to be very honest and very transparent with you. When I was younger in the ministry and a young pastor, I thought I had to be able to answer every question. But the older I get, the less I know and the less I try to answer the questions. I can't tell you why your child died. I can't tell you why you've not been able to have a child. I can't tell some of you why a marriage marriage ended that you didn't see coming to uh, to end. I can't tell you some things. I don't understand everything. I know we live in a world that is cursed. I know we live in a world where there is a devil. But when I can't understand and give you an answer, there is one thing I still know that God is God and He will always be God and He is a good God. Do you believe what I'm preaching? to you today he is always good you can trust him somebody give him praise today I want to tell you something this isn't in my notes but I saw it while I was reading the scripture you can trust the providence of God today you don't have to be afraid because God is in control but it hit me while I read the scripture a while ago God the angel of the Lord said something to her the Lord is with you Mm. the Lord is with you Can I tell you today that that one promise, if you took out all the other promises, that one promise is enough for me to get by. That one promise lets me know I can make it. Look at your neighbor and say, God is with you. And furthermore, He will not leave you. 
He will not forsake you. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in my in my soul this morning. How do you know? Psalm 23 said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. May I tell you, Matthew 28, 20 says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end. Can I give you another one? Hebrews 13, 5 says, He has said to you, I will will never leave you and I will never forsake you. What are you saying? In pain, He's there. In sorrow, He's there. In confusion, He's there. In the good times, He's there. In the bad times, He's there. On the mountaintops, He's there. Down in the valley, He's there. In your loneliness, He's there. In your despair, He's there. In your sorrow, He's there. You will never live a day without the presence of an almighty God. Somebody bless him today. For I declare to you that I have not left you and I will not leave you. I am with you. Though the night be long and the way be rough, I am with you. Hold my hand. I will see you through, saith the Lord of hosts. Lift your hand right now. When your life is challenged and everything changes on a dime, He is with you. How? How am I going to make it through this? How am I going to get through this? How can this be? How? I've never had a relationship with a man. How can it be? He said, the Spirit of the Lord is going to come upon you. My God, I feel Him. I'm seeing things in this I didn't see this week. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is going to come upon you. Can I tell you, a divine encounter is enough to get the job done. I said, a divine encounter is enough to get the job done. My God, I feel Him. This week, I found a video on YouTube. Imagine that. (laughs) I found a video on YouTube. The singing was very much like the singing was when I came in the Church of God 30 years ago. Almost 31 years ago. I sat. I laughed. I cried. I shook like a leaf. I watched it. I wept. Because it hit me. Everybody look at me and listen to me. A divine encounter with God is something you never get over. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I don't care what, where you go. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to go on record saying this. If you have ever truly been touched by the power of the Holy Ghost, if you have ever truly been touched by the power of the Holy Ghost, if you've ever known the anointing of God, I don't care what you go through. I don't care. Money will never take its place. Sex will never take its place. Drugs will never take its place. Alcohol will never take its place. There is nothing that will take the place of a divine encounter of God. What are you saying? I'm saying for some of you, all you need today is a divine encounter. You need the Spirit of God to come down on you. The Spirit of God is going to come on you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And here's what I like. For with God nothing shall be impossible. I can't believe the virgin birth. 
Well, I can because the first man, Adam, got here without the aid of a man or a woman. Nothing is too hard for God. I always tell this story around Christmas if I can fit it in. I'm talking about there being nothing too hard for God. There was a preacher in the state of Kansas in the 40's named Ralph Acre, a Church of God preacher. We had no churches hardly in Arizona. And God spoke to Ralph Acre and said, I want you to leave this church and I want you to go to Arizona and start a church. And God began to deal with Ralph Acre about starting a church, planning a church, going to an area where he knew no one. And that call would not leave Brother Acre. And his son contracted a disease called diphtheria. And he started dying with diphtheria. And that particular year, Christmas was on Sunday. And that boy is lying in the parsonage bed in a coma. Dying with diphtheria. Ralph Acre dismissed his congregation that Sunday and stayed by himself for a few minutes in the sanctuary. And he went to the altar and he prayed. And he heard the sovereign voice of God that says, Will you go to Arizona? And finally he said, Yes, Lord, I will go. But he said, God... Would you please let me stay here long enough to bury my son? And God spoke to him and said, I've healed him. Mm. Ralph Acre walked up to that parsonage and that boy still lying in bed, comatose. And Ralph Acre hoped against hope, my God. God, I feel the Holy Ghost. He reached down and grabbed that boy by the hand and said, In Jesus' name, God said, You're healed. And that boy's been comatose for days, and his eyes pop open. And he looks up at him, and the first thing he says is, Daddy wins Christmas. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I wish somebody would praise him. And that boy ate Christmas lunch that day at that parsonage table, healed by the power of God. Ralph Acre took his family to Arizona. And he got down in the desert. I'm still talking about a God with whom nothing's impossible. And his car overheated. And he and his wife and children are in that car and it's boiling over. And Sister Acre says, what are we going to do? He says, I'm going to go pray. Ralph Acre walks up, walks out in the middle of a desert. Falls on his knees and says, God, I've got to have water. You call me here. He gets up and starts walking back and notices a pipe right over to the left. And guess what's gushing out of it in the middle of a desert? Water. Let me tell you something. When your life changes on a dime, there's a God that's with you. And a God that can do anything. Would you give Him praise today? Stand all over the building. Don't be afraid. Look over at your neighbor and say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God's got this. God's got your situation. 
The doctor doesn't, but God does. I said, God's got it. I don't know what you're battling this morning, but somebody's battling something. God wouldn't have me to preach this. Somebody is battling something. Father, right now, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, God, to touch in this congregation. God, whatever it is that people are battling, they don't have to be afraid anymore. God, they don't have to be afraid anymore. No one looking around. You're here today and you'll say, Pastor, I'm battling anxiety over a problem. I'm battling anxiety over this, over that. And I need God to touch me. Shoot your hand up quick, quick. Get it up, get it up, get it up. Put your hand down. Some of you guys move the table in the operas, please. Just put it up on stage. Do we still believe or is this too simplistic? Do we still believe we can take our burdens to the Lord and leave them there? We still believe that. We still believe in the church of God that with God nothing's impossible. If you raised your hand that you're battling, I want you to walk down here. Come on, quick, 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 quick. Quick, line up across the front. Come on, from the balcony, come. Come very quickly. If I could have some altar workers to... Make sure they're lined up across where people can stand behind them, please. You couldn't have picked a better song. I want, I want us, before we pray, I want us to sing this. Sing it. It's old, you know it. Sing it. Everybody sing, lift your voices. Faith comes by singing things like this. Sing, sing, he's all. Lift your hands, that's worship, that's surrender. Sing it, keep singing it, keep singing it. Oh, he's all I need. He's all I need. Jesus is all. Sing it again. shoulder there are people across this building that you need God today you need God today altar workers lay your hands on them sing